Hi, well, Caleb has his bell set, so I can only talk so long. So we'll see what happens here. Uh, isn't, it, isn't it marvelous, the age that we live in, that, uh, that we can do this? Uh, let us take a minute and pray. Lord, we thank you so much that, uh, that we can get together like this. We, we love each other. We want to see each other, and um, uh, we want to hug each other. We know that's going to be put off for a few weeks, but um, we certainly know that uh, you're involved in what's going on and that you will uh, make good out of bad. You always do. And we look forward to uh, seeing what the outcome of all this is. We pray for those who are ill and ask that they be healed rapidly. And we pray for those in our church who are ill and that they also should uh, be healed rapidly by your intercession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, today I'd like to talk about, um, uh, well, my Bible the title is uh, Jesus Predicts His Crucifixion which is John 12, 20 through 33. John 12, 20 through 33. It says, Now some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. Uh, so they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested of him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus replied to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. The one who loves his life will lose it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him or her. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour, Father. Glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said that an angel had spoken to him. Jesus responded, This voice came not for me, but for you. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I am lifted out up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to signify what kind of death he was about to die. The mean clarifies the end here. People are ready for Easter. Did you know Easter is only three weeks away? Four Sundays. April the 12th. We all want to hear Easter. We all want to come to Easter because Easter is when all the good comes out from the end. Uh, we're going on through the bad, but the good comes out at Easter, the resurrection. And that's why so many people attend church on Easter to celebrate the end of the story. In Christ's resurrection is our hope. Yes, we know there is starts, the temptation, the struggle, the cross, but all of that is swallowed up in Easter's victory over sin and death. That is all we need, victory. The final note to be played, Christ is risen or the hymn that we love, Victory in Jesus, or Christ Victor. Yes, but we are rushing, you see, into this triumphant ending without hearing the means to the end. Let's listen to the story. Here in the 12th chapter of John's Gospel, as Jesus faces his death, there's a quick summary of his turmoil and the glory that was set before him. Listen to two verses from our text. John 12, 27 through 28. 27. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. 
Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Verse 27 appears to be the summarizing that we crave. It is a span of just a few words. Jesus goes from being deeply troubled, a deeply troubled soul, to one who has clearly and confidently come for this very reason. He understands exactly why he is here. He prays that he will glorify his Father and receives confirmation of that glory. So the summary of these two verses is correct. But A to B is no easy road. The means of glorifying the Father in the end points to his faithfulness in the face of temptation each step of the way. Let us insert ourselves as the Greeks in this story. Let us become the Greeks in verses 20 and 21. Now there were some Greeks, you and I, among those who went up to worship at the feast. That's the... Uh, Passover. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And uh, he sort of qualms and hems and haws, I get a, bit, a little bit about it. So he goes to Andrew and says, hey, Andrew, these guys want to see Jesus. So he and Andrew go tell Jesus that these Greeks want to come and talk to him. Well, they had sort of tagged along. The hour has come, you see, for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus seems to be addressing the two disciples. Yet the Greeks are important in the story because the story of Easter is the Father's mission given to Jesus. The mission for the Greek and the Jew. John also makes clear in the latter part of his gospel that the universal mission is complicated in the death and resurrection of the Son of Man. It's a little hard for them to believe, for them to understand what's going on here. The glorifying of the Son and the Father is seen in Easter and Good Friday, where the goal of Jesus' mission was to provide a way for human beings to be reconciled to God, the one who stood in for us. Jesus took it for us. He stood in for us. He was fully human. He had to be to stand in for us. And this means of this redemption Jesus was continually giving himself up to the will of the Father. I tell you the truth, he said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This one verse is actually the eightfold death and resurrection of Christ illustrated. First, necessity, unless, except. Second, cause, the fall. Third, place, into the ground. Fourth, present state, dies, death. Fifth, unselfishness only. Six, resurrection produces, brings forth. Seven, purpose produces many seeds, much fruit. The mystery of it all is number eight, the mystery of it all. Many elements of mystery surround the death and resurrection of any seed. We believe a dead grain multiplies itself and we are nourished by its multiplication. 
but we cannot understand how it is done. We cannot tell how one grain becomes multiplied into many, how the earth, the air, the water, and sunshine cooperate together to create new life. We believe it, not because we understand it, but because it produces results. If we cannot explain and fully understand these earthly things of one little seed, then why do we have to understand the infinite purposes and works of God in redeeming men through death, burial, and resurrection of Christ before we believe? No matter how we seek to understand the mystery of the dual nature of Jesus, as that of God and that of man, the fourth gospel will not let us understand his obedience to the Father as automatic or without struggle. <clears throat> Excuse me. The fourth gospel does not show us Jesus' deep distress in the Garden of Gethsemane. Instead, we have the strange arresting words of his soul being troubled. How could this description mean a temporary or minor disturbance? The writer of Hebrews picks up the theme and shows the one whom John calls the Son of Man, expressing himself in loud cries and tears. At the very least, a Savior of humanity who cries out in distress gives us permission to live a life before God of emotional honesty. That is no small thing. To glorify the Father does not require a persona of a victorious overcomer who never allows turmoil of the soul to come to the surface. Jesus did not teach us to never let them see you cry or sweat. The evidence is not only in Gethsemane. It is here in these summary verses that point to the ongoing means of Jesus glorifying the Father. Even more than this modeling of emotional honesty is a clear reminder that the only mediator between God and man never ceases to be fully human. That is why it is literally a damnable pity to expunge from the record Jesus' struggle with what lay before him. For the means of our salvation was no easy road. Now my soul is turmoil, he said. How can we possibly enter into this wrestling with God and the rejection by his friends? Here's a stark reminder that our Christ was not a plastic saint, much less an immature or an immune God. After crying out that his soul was in turmoil, he asked if he should pray. Father, save me from this hour. And here again we see the means by which he lived out his mission. Not just the end, but each step of the way. For it is in the summary of verse 27 that we glimpse the intensity of the prayerful struggle that was to mark his life about to end. For Jesus' prayer was not a pious rehearsal. It was an honest, no-holds-barred communication with Abba, Father. This intimate and honest form of prayer is seen in the 17th chapter of John. He is not afraid to pray for his own faithful completion of his mission. He prays for his disciples including those who are admonished to walk in the light in our text today, so that they may all be one. And they and we, John 17, 20 through 21, have been prayed for by Jesus even before Jesus goes over the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden in John 18, 1. 
John does not give us details of Christ's passion in that garden. Others do. But the daily giving himself up to the will of the Father. Each day he is giving in to the will of the Father, as we should be doing. This is the way of the cross for us. A daily dying into life allows our life to be surrendered to the Christ who surrendered his will to the Father. This does not happen by avoiding the struggle of obedience. Obey is a four-letter word. This is our stumbling block. Who does not want to surrender? Nobody wants to surrender. It's my way, not your way. That's not what God says. Surrender. Surrender to Christ. Surrender to God. We don't want to surrender to anyone. Remember the old hymn, I surrender all? Well, that's what we need to surrender. We need to surrender all unto Jesus. We cannot be saved from this hour of decision unless we surrender all. For the one who faced the struggles of his soul was listed up on the object of defeat. That place of shame became the territory of God's glory. There death was defeated and the resurrection made possible. As Christ is lifted up, he is drawing all men and women to himself. In our surrender to him, we are made alive. And God's name is glorified. I surrender all. I'm not going to sing that. Maybe we'll sing it when we get together. Love y'all. Amen. God bless.